here's the rough agenda I hope to get through. Uh, we'll skip around a little bit. I want to give everyone a kind of an idea of why this is important. If you don't already know, I think everyone has seen at least the increase of bots that have been rampant and proliferated over the last year or so. Uh, by last, uh, last person I've talked to has given me a count of bots that have um, been known to be unique bots of upwards of 4 million um, hosts. And I don't know how you come at that count, but 4 million hosts sure sounds like a lot of bots to me. A lot of scary packet potential there. Um, if if nothing else, there's probably at least a few hundred thousand. So as this has risen over the past year, I think it's important for network operators to talk about this. If there's anything that we can do, we should sort of look at uh, looking at ways to mitigate this. And what we're going to try to focus on is more of the command and control infrastructure rather than compromised hosts. We've had compromised hosts forever. Uh, we certainly can't get rid of all of those, but we, there's ways that we can minimize the effect of the botnets and their uh, malicious intent, usually in the form of denial of service attacks or uh, phishing, phishing expositions, those sorts of things. Uh, it might be nice to, for us if we can mitigate some of that. Sorry. I should be okay. We're going to primarily focus on IRC-based botnets. Now, IRC um, is probably used in the majority of botnets that you see where a, there's a centralized command and control infrastructure. And by centralized, it could be one or more IRC servers but certainly fewer IOC servers than there are number of bots. And there's been other command and control infrastructures, whether it's peer-to-peer -peer or instant messaging, but IRC by and large is the command and, con command and control infrastructure of choice. You have uh, probably at least a few hundred, a few thousand uh, rogue IRC servers that have been known or seen in the wild. And the bot is nothing more than uh, malware installed on a host that contains exploit tools and attack tools um, and the actual IRC client code. And we've had a, at least a, a miscreant or two in the back there that's told us about the reasons for botnets are sometimes for fun, but most often today they're for profit. So people are making really a lot of money managing botnets, attacking people uh, either through denial of service attacks or stealing credit cards and those sorts of things. There's really, there's really three parts to the basic command and control infrastructure of today's botnets that are based on IRC. There's the IRC servers themselves. Then there's the DNS names that are used to associate to those host addresses that are the IRC servers. And then there's often a vanity-based web page uh, where the malware will be installed so the bots can go update themselves with new attack tools and uh, new IRC client code. None of this is really new, though. Three years ago this month, there was a paper released at CERT that talked about all this stuff except for the vanity web pages. So none of this information is really all that new. What we're trying to do is really kind of raise the, the level of understanding by network operators that this stuff is out there. And it, it's proliferated to the, fact, to the point that we need to really start looking at how to deal with this before it starts taking down the larger networks. So the bots are made up of the malware. And there's really two ways that a bot will become a bot. One is the come and get it method, where either via some link in an email or uh, via web page or peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, that someone's enticing you to come get something that you, you think that you want, but in fact, it's really a piece of malware that contains the bot code. And the other, the other way to get a bot is simply via remote exploit. And this seems to be reducing slightly thanks to Service Pack 2. Uh, just anecdotal evidence from people I've talked to, they've seen approximately about a third of their hosts uh, drop in being remotely exploitable from some of the common Microsoft uh, exploits that have been released over the past year. So that's somewhat of a good sign. I don't think that's going to really have an overall huge impact on bots and botnets, though. Uh, it may somewhat reduce the level of a flash worm type effect. Uh, but I think we'll probably see bots and botnets continue to flourish for some time. So here's the themes that I, I kind of want to focus on is any network-based mitigation that we can do is good. Simpler the better. And looking at the command and control infrastructure, if there's things that we can do to disrupt that command and control infrastructure, we may, may not be able to get rid of all those bots. But if we can disrupt that command and control infrastructure, we disrupt the ability for those botnets to perform their work, which is usually denial of service attacks, 
which network operators is probably the most offensive uh, the things that we don't like to see. So there's the rogue IRC controller, and a rogue IRC controller is nothing more than an IRC server that's set up primarily for the use of corralling and managing a botnet network. So this isn't the public IRC servers like EFNet or Downnet that you may be familiar with. This is an IRC server typically installed on an already compromised host, probably a host that already had a bot that's just simply been promoted. There's usually a few uh, characteristics to a rogue IRC server uh, that you might not find in a typical IRC server. The IRC protocol defaults to port 6667 on TCP. Commonly you see any port being used, in fact a number of ports that are just odd ports on TCP being used for IRC servers that are rogue. Information gathering commands like who is or listing channels are often disabled or booby trapped to alert any of the miscreant operators that you're onto them and looking around on the rogue IRC server. Servers are occasionally not uh, that often, but occasionally password protected. Channels are hidden so you can't see them in an information gathering list command. Uh, they're probably password protected. And there's probably a few other things that may indicate that you're dealing with a rogue IRC server. If you're able to see the login messages or, some, or if you're able to log into a rogue IRC server, some of the things that you might find that would tip you off is that there's a high number of invisible to visible users. That is where a user on an IRC server has masked their identity so you can't see who they are or list them out in one of the information gathering commands. Or if there's a large number of users on the server, but there's only three or four channels, that would tend to indicate that that's really not a valid server because how often do you see a few thousand people on a channel having a discussion? And it just doesn't happen unless it's moderated. Um, there's a few other things and I'll just show you um, a couple examples in the next slide. But real quick, the, a couple of the DNS things, and DNS is a really handy thing to keep an eye on to identify and track rogue IRC servers. A DNS name is almost always used because it's an easy way to locate an IRC server, especially if an IRC server goes away. It's a com compromised machine like any other. It's often going to be susceptible to being detected and then taken offline. So a DNS name provides a way for a miscreant to set up a network based on a name that can be shifted around to different A records. And uh, believe it or not, a lot of the, the names that are associated with rogue IRC servers are pretty obvious. When, once you see the name, it's often something that just looks rogue. So, and so far, that's been a good thing, at least for the people who are fighting bonnets. So here is a simplified example of what you might find if you were to watch a bot logging onto a rogue IRC server. Now, there's a number of things that's wrong with this picture. Uh, one, there's a couple of names here that either don't resolve or just don't exist. Uh, there's a large number of users that are invisible. There's a large number of users to channels available. Uh, there's only one operator online. Typically, if you have a significantly large IRC network, you're going to have more operators so that they can manage that network. If you only got one, that's usually a sign that it's a rogue IRC server as well. And of course, you got a suspicious looking uh, channel name as well as the topic for that channel. Then there's IRC networks that are set up to appears to be primarily used for rogue, uh, not rogue, but uh, somewhat suspicious file sharing of, of wares or copyrighted material like movies and music. And it's not entirely clear that these IRC servers should be shut down completely, but certainly a lot of activity that occurs on them is, is at least or best suspicious. And so this is not unlike peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Now it's been said, and it's probably a good argument to make in this room, that these type of networks, even though they're bots and they're, they're compromised and maybe have backdoor FTP servers on them, uh, maybe this is something best left to the software police type of organizations. We've got enough problems to deal with with attacks and other things. Um, if this isn't impacting infrastructure, let someone else go after these for a change. And then, you've, believe it or not, there are legitimate IRC servers. Uh, there's probably a few people in a, an IRC server and Nanog channel mocking my presentation right now. And there's, uh, but there's bots that tend to coalesce on the, these servers, generally for the, the, uh, the purpose of migrating from one rogue IRC server to another. If, you, if you're running a rogue IRC server and it gets taken down, you need to move to another IRC server, obviously. But before you can do that, you might park yourself on a legitimate IRC server, kind of corral everyone together before you move off. And that happens pretty frequently. And there, of course, there's some miscreants who uh, actually build their botnets on, on real IRC servers, although you don't find that a whole lot, especially not really large botnets. Luckily, most of the legitimate IRC servers are run by pretty good folks, and they tend to get rid of those bots pretty quickly. 
Although if you talk to them, they're pretty hesitant to kill off bots too quickly because they know if they do, the people who run those botnets are going to come after them and they have uh, nothing to lose to do so. So IRC, net IRC networks are often target of attacks. But if uh, IRC servers can do a little bit more in monitoring, if they take a look at uh, the spikes in their connections that come in, if they see a huge number of connections coming in at uh, small intervals, that may be botnets coming in. If they see long idle connections, particularly for one channel, and with NICs that are analogous, where they, you've got a prefix to a NIC that everyone shares and then a few random characters after that, that usually indicates that there's a botnet forming there. And so it's, they're in a unique position to actually find some of this stuff. And while they don't necessarily have to shut them all down and take the packet pain that comes with it, they could possibly report them to a group like DShield or My Net Watchman to get some of those hosts cleaned up. <coughs> DNS plays a very important role for miscreants in rogue IRC servers. One or more IP addresses can be associated with a name, and the name is very easy to come by. You can typically get a name for free or very low cost from a number of providers all over the world. And the records that are used for rogue IRC servers well, often they look rogue in the name themselves. One of the clues often is you see that the TTL of that record is very low. Usually it's on the order of five minutes or even a few seconds. Just in case an actual host goes away, they can update that record so they can point their bots at a different server. And I, I'm not really much of a pro programmer. I say I know Combat Pearl, and I created this um, script called DNS Watch that you can watch DNS records change over time. And a good example is you can pipe a couple of uh, sites like Yahoo or Google to it, and you can watch as a name changes IP addresses over some period of time. Um, and so you could, if you can't get a, an A record pulled from a DNS provider, you might be able to at least monitor where that A record points over some, um, some period of your monitoring time. So in order to, to find DNS, there's probably at least three ways that you can do so. If you run a DNS server that's recursive for a bunch of hosts that may have bots, you can certainly turn on query logging. Uh, I'm most familiar with bind, so any of my DNS examples are going to be associated with bind. Uh, but you can turn on query logging. Uh, very few people seem to do that, probably because of the performance impact that that, that involves and the disk space that it's going to take. Uh, but that's one option. What it doesn't give you, though, is the A records. It just gives you the name that a uh, host you're querying for. The other kind of a newer technique, which is a really interesting one, and I think a really useful one, is that people can set up a packet capture on their egress points or points where DNS traffic crosses between their network, and they look for the responses coming back from queries going to uh, servers outside their network. And what you're looking for is you're looking to capture an A record that has both the, the query that was named, the name that was queried for, and then the A records associated with that query. And you take that information, you don't really need to know specifically who's querying for it. You just want to build a database of names associated to IP addresses over time. So that you can uh, take a look through, if you see or suspect a particular host is a rogue controller, or if you suspect a particular name, you can search through your database and associate one with the other. And the, what that buys you over the query logging is that you have a history. And of course, the, the really hard way is if you actually have a bot where you can get the code that's used on the bot and you can take a look at that malware and either analyze it or set it up in a lab and see what it actually queries for. Now, once a bot is connected to a rogue IC server, it's typically not going to query that name very often. So unless you're looking, you're not going to find it. If a name gets closed, if the DNS provider closes that name, then there's some clues that will queue you into a rogue name, and I'll talk about it in the next slide. But if, you, if that name is not queried very often, but you know a host is compromised, either you've gotten an email from somebody or you've uh, suspected a host having a bot for some other reason, you can bounce that link, and then if you can put a tap on that host, you can watch for the DNS query that it's going to make. Anytime you see repetitive A queries, and by repetitive I mean a lot of A queries, uh, usually in the period of a few minutes, like every few seconds or even many times a second, um, that should probably trigger something in your brain because there's not too many hosts, except for automated software like bots, that are going to be querying for a name over and over and over and over again, particularly over a long period of time. What that's telling you is that there's a host out there that's infected. It's set up to talk to a rogue IRC server. It's looking for a particular server based on some name, but that name's been pulled. Okay, and the software on that client hasn't been updated to look for a new name. And so if that name's closed, the, the, the bots are really not that smart. They try to connect at every chance they get. And as long as they're not connected, they're going to tr keep trying to connect. So they're going to make queries over and over again, and that's going to either fill up your query logs, or you're going to see that DNS traffic attempt going at your recursive DNS servers. 
in all the cases I've seen, all the bots are querying their local uh, resolvers, either their, their local cache or their, uh, the local reconfigured uh, DNS servers. If you suspect uh, spam bots in your network, you can certainly look for MX queries, obviously for hosts that uh, you don't think are running uh, mail servers. Um, any other server that you don't expect to be running as a server may be making a lot of reverse queries, which may indicate you've got a controller on your network. A lot of the IRC servers out there are configured to do kind of a weak form of authentication by doing a reverse query on all the hosts that attach to them. And there seems to be some general patterns that you can glean out of DNS names. Now, I couldn't give you a, a generic regular expression that you can send through your DNS query logs and say this is for sure a bad DNS name that's being used for controller, but there's some patterns that you do find. You typically see three levels. You see a host name, subdomain, and top level domain. It's not always the case, but probably at least 90% of the time, that's how the names are formed. And then there's certain patterns within certain names. There's certain popular TLDs that tend to be used more often than not. And at least for us from EDUs, I've yet to see one for a rogue name at uh, a .edu uh, service. So that's kind of a good thing for us. And finally, something we can't be blamed for. Some of you uh, may also be DNS admins in addition to just standard network, operate, network operation people. So if you run a DNS service, there's some things that you should probably do if you're not already doing. You should log resource record changes. So anyone who's updating their records, uh, and not only the records that they're making changes on, but also where they're coming from and making those changes. The latter helps you, once you identify that someone's updating names for rogue IRC controller, you can go back and see what other names might be bad. And uh, logging the source of those changes will tell you um, or at least give you a record of, of some information that you can provide to law enforcement or anyone who's trying to track back the source of the operator of, of that botnet. Something that I don't know that much about DNS admin services that are provided out there, other than what I've been told is that a number of them, or a number of you perhaps, are not pulling records that have been set up with invalid credit cards. If you find that you've been uh, swindled with an invalid credit card, go look through your records and pull any record that's associated with those invalid credit cards. Just kind of makes sense to me. I don't know what the issues are there. Um, maybe it's just too much work to do. Um, certainly a lot of DNS, DNS providers have, uh, do a, providing a free service or a low cost service, maybe just don't have enough staff to handle some of this. And one of the best things that you can do if you're a DNS admin, and you've discovered a name that's been bad, is not just pull the record entirely, but set the TTL fairly high. And I would recommend at least a minimum of seven days and maybe up to 30 days. 60-something years is probably too long, um, but at least 30 days or seven days even at the minimum would be a, a nice setting. What that does is it, it kind of poisons that local uh, recursive server where the bots may be, so that when that record gets updated, they're still querying for a name that's been closed. Now, which address do you close with? Do you point the, the record at a loopback address? Do you point it at an RFC 1918 address? Do you point it at something else? There's still some debate about what the standard address should be when you close a name. And it probably won't ever be in agreement because it's going to differ for different people. I'll just tell you that if you use an RFC 1918 address, people who have bots may end up actually trying to contact legitimate hosts. They may actually be using that address space within their network. So that address space is particularly a problem. If you use uh, another kind of address space like testnet or um, any other reserve space, you never any other reserve space, you never know if that's going to be in use or not. I tend to think 240 slash 4 might be a good one because I don't, I've never heard of anyone actually using that address space. Um, although if you're using it, I'd be just curious to know that you are. Loopback tends to be the most popular address to close with, um, but there's one potential problem with a loopback address. If you point a record at a loopback address, if you remember back when Blaster came out, a bunch of people set the Windows Update name to a loopback address and then realized when the worm went to attack the Windows Update address, they saw, these, saw the strange traffic on the network. They saw all these packets from a source address to all these strange destination addresses within their network, all, all these spoofed source addresses. What happened is Blaster actually source spoofed the attack to the Windows Update address. But the Windows Update address was pointed at 127 in a lot of people's organizations who, who kind of preempted Microsoft. And so what they did was they, the worm actually sent out a packet with a source spoofed address attacking themselves which they probably were not running a web server, but yet still would respond to that fake spoof source address. And so then that pack would actually bounce off their host and head out to nowhere. 
So it's, uh, it's questionable which address you set it to close with. Um, use what's best for you, I suppose. But if we could come to our standard, I suppose that might be nice. So at least we know that it's been closed. And if you're a DNS admin, if you've got a name that's closed, it's probably a good idea to share it with other DNS admins through a DNS black hole list, like the link I tried here. And the reason is that if they, the miscreant, owns a particular domain, they can easily move it to somebody else. So you want to let others know that, hey, this domain is bad and you don't want to let people set up names under this. Finally, it's kind of the last resort. This is a little bit of a pain to set up, but you can do a black hole or a sinkhole. And here again, example with, with a bind. You can set up any number of zone records based on a host name that you suspect is bad. And so in your named econ file, you could set up all these zones. It could be rogue.example.net or paxor.example.net or whatever the name is. And you can point them all to this db bad name. And then this db bad name is just a, a generic uh, zone file. The most important thing probably being at the bottom here, the, the A record that it actually points to. And all this does is says um, anytime any, anyone's going to query for that name, they're just going to get back that address. Okay. So you can black hole or sink hole them or however you want to do it. Of course, some of the bind purists uh, may be uh, freaking out, and that may not be the best thing to do if uh, you really care about the consistency of the database. But certainly as a last resort, that might be an option. Now there's a problem. DNS is a really handy thing to know. And if you know DNS and you can close DNS for a botnet, that really helps a lot. But there's a problem, because there's multiple pieces to the command and control infrastructure. There's DNS, but there's also an IP address or multiple IP addresses. There may even be multiple DNS names. If you close one and not the other, the botnet may still live without even losing a single bot, maybe with even minimal downtime. There's actually some redundancy built right in. If you close the name, but the controller host is still up and all the bots are connected, all the miscreant has to do is tell all the bots to update their code to point to a new DNS name. So the next time they get disconnected, they're going to query for the new name. And vice versa, the reverse is also true. If the controller goes away, but the name is still there, and the TTL is really small, it's going to only take probably a few seconds or a few minutes to query for the, uh, the new address associated with that name. I don't know exactly how to fix this problem because usually the address and the name are not managed by the same entity. So it's kind of a difficult problem to figure out how to actually do both at the same time. Now some ideas that have um, been bandied about a little bit with DNS uh, software hacks, I would call them. Um, one, not so much specific to botnets themselves, but what you see when a name gets closed, if a botnet still has, or the bots in the botnet still has the same malware and they're still querying for a name that's been closed, you see those repetitive queries happening over and over again. And because it's a recursive query, at least the bind with what I'm familiar with, has to create essentially state for each query as it goes and tries to fetch uh, the full record. And there's usually a limit in some period or some interval of queries that clients can make. And if things are querying recursively fast enough, you can reach that limit and then it shuts down every other host from making recursive queries. So a knob that might be useful is to have a rate limiter for recursive queries, or what I would prefer actually is some kind of write queue mechanism. You can possibly do this in your OS, in your stack, or your upstream router. Uh, you may not be able to do it specific to the recursive queries, um, but I know of people who have tried to do that as well. The other thing that could be useful, uh, a feature request in some DNS software, is, is to have a regular expression support so that you can more easily uh, sync hole or black hole names. Uh, so rather than having to do that kind of black hole sinkhole zone hack that we had before, having something you can do possibly without even having to restart your name server is to be able to say anything from, you know, uh, paxor.net gets black hole or sinkhole. Okay. Again, that may be kind of mucking with the, you know, that unique DNS database. That may not be such a good thing, but it might be an option some people are looking for. And I put snuck in a bullet point here that's probably not in the slides that we have online. Um, another thing that stops people from um, even looking at DNS is they don't log the queries because of the performance impact. So something that we're all familiar with in NetFlow is having a, a sampling mechanism. So while you may not be able to get uh, a record of every single packet that goes through your box, the same thing for DNS. We may not need every single log record uh, for a query in our DNS server, but if we had a sample, that might be at least useful, reduce the performance impact, and reduce the, the disk space requirements. Now, the network mitigation techniques are actually a little bit harder to come up with concretely because unless you've got eyes into your network where you can do packet inspection, that is, you can analyze the contents of packets, figuring out what a bot is and what a botnet uh, controller looks like is relatively difficult. Um, but some general uh, 
recommendations you've all heard or mostly heard before is the you know maintaining flows, uh, setting up bug on and dark space monitoring. Um, the one that you don't hear talk about too much, but which is even more useful, is having a distributed microblock sinkhole or a uh, black hole. So here the idea is rather than uh, taking unused address space, take a small slash 29 or even a slash 32 out of, out of your heavily used address space and point that at a sinkhole or black hole. And if the worms and the botnets are typically often worm-based looking to do some remote exploits, if they're scanning based on locality, that is within a subnet, uh, chances are better that you'll find them if you can take one of those microblock allocations and, and point them at a sinkhole. Okay, again, some more stuff that you've all heard before, at least I hope you have. The ingress and egress filters, um, you should have both. Uh, a lot, common asked question is whether you should filter on port zero, UDP or TCP. And the, the quick answer to that is no. And the reason for that is because you end up having fragments that will look like port zero. So you probably don't want to filter them. As, as much as we don't typically like to see fragments on the network, uh, you will block legitimate traffic if you block port zero. Now, certainly in a dire situation, you may need to do that. Um, but be careful if you block port zero. And in fact, UDP actually is completely valid uh, in sending a UDP source port zero. Okay, a lot of media streams will do that. On the Nanog list and other places people have talked about and implemented uh, filtering for bots or the controllers. And that's something that has uh, uh, some effect, some positive effect, but also has some collateral damage. Keep in mind that bots and botnet um, controllers may be um, more than just a Windows PC in someone's home. Maybe a virtual server, it may be something that's kind of important to someone that's actually in production use. Now, you may say too bad, and that's fine. A lot of people will do that. Um, but you know, certainly your mileage may vary. And again, bots and botnet controllers come and go. So that list has to ma be maintained and kept up to date. And something kind of a pet peeve of mine is, what are you sending to multicast address space? This is just kind of a general uh, kind of removing the bad stuff, obvious bad stuff out of your network that you can do. You support multicast. There's certainly no reason to see TCP packets going to the multicast address space. So a really easy thing to do if your hardware can handle it is filter out any TCP packets to 224 slash 4. Now, in fact, you can actually do the reverse probably a little bit easier. You could say, I only want to allow certain things to 224 slash 4. And we could talk about that at an NSP sec bot or later offline if you'd like. But there's a lot of stuff that you can pull out of that address space that shouldn't be there. If you're not doing flows, you should be. That's essentially the, the idea behind this slide. Um, just to point out, if you're using flow tools, or if you're not using flow tools and want to, I would just point you to Ed's post uh, from a year or two ago. Go look for this. Uh, the title of this, his uh, message was checking for DOS or port scanning traffic. He had a real simple one-liner, um, basically using flow tools, piping to awk, and it actually works pretty well in detecting scanners or denial service attacks uh, on your flows. A new tool that's coming available, and I highly recommend people check it out, is called NF Dump. It's actually part of a uh, larger package, um, but the idea is similar to flow tools. It's a collector, it's got uh, some uh, reporting tools and so forth. But the real nice thing about this is it's based on TCP dump syntax. So if you're familiar with flow tools, one of the pains has always been you've got to create an nflow filter file, and you've got to kind of set that up uh, manually, or it's a little bit pain to set up via script. But with NF dump, if you can do it like TCP dump syntax, you can really make your scripts a little bit simpler or interface that on a web page a little bit easier. So it's still relatively new. It doesn't have the full feature set. Uh, but because it's being actively developed, so you can go check that out and, and get all your features that you want in there. Now, some general things that may uh, lead you to believe that there's uh, botnets or controllers um, active somewhere on your network or tr suspicious traffic that you may want to take a closer look at. And there's a number of things that you can come up with. Kind of figuring out how to create your algorithms and pull the stuff out and make any sense of it is a little bit tricky. Um, but just to give you some general ideas, if you do just flow monitoring at your borders, and, and some of the large networks probably don't do that. They have them, have them everywhere. But for some of the smaller networks that have lots of subnets, you really kind of want to try to do flow monitoring at your edges as much as possible. Because again, worms and uh, bots that are parts of these networks look like worms. And their scanning is kind of a locality base where it's within their subnet. So if you're only monitoring flows at your border, you may miss a lot of activity. 
And so if you can see these scans and you can associate them with a TCP connection, possibly to uh, some controller, you may be spotted by or the road controller itself. So of course, anything to dark space or short, short flows um, or lots of flows from a single source to multiple destinations. If you see a lot of flows, uh, send packets going out with resets or unreachables coming back, so that could be uh, scanning coming in. Um, you can also do analysis based on packet sizes. IRC traffic is typically not going to be a bunch of 1500 by packets. It's very interactive, it's very conversational. Uh, so if you see um, traffic that kind of follows that pattern, um, you can uh, put that into your suspect list as well. A lot of bots infect each other remotely and pass the, the exploit code, usually over FTP on a standard or, or a odd number port, or via TFTP. So if you see TFTP in particular in your network, and you see a lot of it, particularly from one or two hosts, certainly that would be a suspect host that might have a lot. Here's some network hacks. I don't know that these should be implemented or even discussed further than here. Um, but the first one is kind of interesting. And XP has kind of done this. Uh, with service pack two, by the way. Uh, if there was, we have packet rate limiters, so you've got, uh, um, and red queues and all kinds of um, dropping out rhythms. But that's all based on packets. If we had something similar based on flows, that would be a, a good system to alarm, at least, uh, based on someone who's trying to talk to a lot of hosts within a short interval. That's usually indicative of file sharing, for one, at least in our universities, uh, but also for scanning attempts. Um, sometimes for denial of service attacks, too, if you're considering the source of those. Uh, people talking about using um, internet pricing schemes again. Um, that was a big research topic a while back. That seemed to have died, but maybe that's coming back and people will have to relearn a bunch of lessons there. I don't know how that's actually um, going to pan out. I suspect it probably won't work uh, for the majority of networks, um, but it's certainly something to consider, I suppose. And then there's people who can go around and uh, hunt out the bots and report malware, report rogue IRC servers, a thankless job. Um, doesn't seem to have that much of an impact if you look at it individually. Um, but if enough people are reporting this stuff and doing something about it, and maybe coming up with some nice ideas to make things easier to stop and mitigate this stuff, you know, maybe that is, uh, you know, old-fashioned hard work is the way to go. Now, I've, I've just got a bunch of miscellaneous slides here at the end. Um, this is just a simple example of if you're wanting to try to catch bots, you can really do so with XP unpatched um, just by setting up IPsec filters. And I won't go through each one of these lines. But the basic idea is here, you can set it up so that your host will actually capture a bot. It'll be able to be infected, but it won't be able to send out a, um, attack traffic like on port TCP 445 or TCP port 135 and you can put in some custom rules for yourself. Now this actually is not perfect. There's in cases where this fails. And certainly if the host gets compromised, the, if the malware is smart enough, it could turn this stuff off. So far I don't ever see bots doing that, um, but certainly it's uh, not beyond possibility. Most of us have routers, so that might be actually better just put that in line and, and you can effectively do the same thing. Things that don't help much, um, there's a few of them, and I would recommend it against all of these. Uh, if you find a rogue IRC server, it's usually not a good idea to go check it out, start doing who is commands, start trying to engage in chat with the person who's operating it. At best, you'll get kicked off. At worst, you'll be drinking out of a fire hose. So I don't generally recommend that for most people. There's really no reason you need to do that. If you can capture some of the traffic and you know it's a rogue IRC server, that's all you need to know. Um, you know, unless you're doing... Uh, Mr. Rob Thomas, I guess. Uh, he likes to play in the underground, but for most people, I don't recommend doing that. Uh, if you do find rogue controllers or bots, uh, don't just tell your friends about them. Say, hey, there's a rogue controller. Check your flows. That doesn't really solve much. Most people won't have flows because uh, there's enough bots to go around. Most people aren't going to have the same bots you have. Uh, but what you can do is at least report it to someone who's responsible. And if you don't know about the Team Kimru who is server, run this command and find out about it. It's a really handy thing to have. It tells you essentially which AS is responsible for routing a particular address. And the other thing, you don't, I don't think you find this in many ISPs, but you would find this in end organizations, those who would block the standard IRC protocol, port 6667. First of all, um, any of you opposed to port filtering like I am, it's just kind of a dumb idea. Uh, there's just too many bit combinations to filter on it. You'll never filter them all. 
But really, more importantly, there's no reason that a row controller has to use port 6667. While a lot of them do, a lot of them don't. Okay, so that really isn't going to solve your problem. Uh, some additional things that uh, go over real briefly. If you are the recipient of a, if you happen to be a lucky recipient of a botnet controller, and I suspect a lot of you have probably had these either unintentionally or maybe perhaps on purpose, um, you can take over that controller either if you have the name or the address. Uh, I generally wouldn't recommend this either, but it's been done. Um, you can corral all the bots and see all the bots that are connecting to it. Um, <clears throat> not something for the, the weak of heart, I suppose. RC traffic is rhythmic. If there's no activity, there's a ping pong uh, keep alive mechanism that happens. So it seems to vary depending on the IRC server that's used, but typically run from 15 to a couple of minutes where there'll be ping pong packets that go back and forth. And again, there's specific patterns to IRC traffic as well. And you certainly wouldn't expect to see lots of 1500 byte packets um, going between bots and the botnet servers. Any Windows host with the port 113 open has probably got a bot on it. That's probably the one port that's not open by default on Windows. <laughs> FTP ports on, on, or FTP services on uh, odd ports is often a bad sign. That's probably one of those uh, gray area botnets where there's uh, um, a private FTP server serving up music files or, or movies. And again, if you can, if, if uh, you can get past kind of the legal and the privacy issues, if you can actually look at the packets, you can do a lot more. There's not been a whole lot of effort to encrypt a lot of this stuff. So if you can match on certain signatures and strings, uh, more than just flows and packet sizes and that's, that sort of thing, you can probably find most of the bots or most of the rogue controllers just based on a few well-known strings. Because there's not a lot of deviation between what they're actually sending and receiving as far as the, the plain text goes. Now, the bad news is there's lots of things that a miscreant could do to, to really harden these botnets to make it harder for any of us to stop them or mitigate them. One of the most obvious is to encrypt stuff. Uh, once that happens, it's going to be really hard, other than the hard work of going out and finding a bot or the malware that's used on the bot, to see what's going on. Why this hasn't happened uh, is not entirely clear, but it, probably the best answer is because it doesn't need to. The miscreants just don't need to do this. Um, the other option may be that it does add some overhead to the malware. I don't think that much. That would certainly make it impossible. You know, 300 kilobytes maybe, maybe a couple of megs at the most. Um, that doesn't seem like a whole lot of effort um, to, to harden a botnet. So once that starts happening, if it does, that's not going to be good. That's going to make the job of finding this stuff a lot harder. IRC will probably be the dominant command and control infrastructure because it's easy and it works really well. There's, there's probably not a reason to use it anything else. It scales really well. Um, there's lots of tools that have been built off, built off the IRC clients, and there's free server software available. Uh, so you'll probably see IRC being the command and con control infrastructure for some time. But there's been other command and control infrastructures, like instant messaging and peer-to-peer -peer file sharing protocols. IPv6 networks. How many of you have flow monitoring in IPv6 networks? Raise a hand. Nobody, because as far as I know, I don't think it exists. All right, so how do you detect botnets or see what sorts of activity is going on. We don't even have the tools to look for this stuff. And if, if you don't think that's happening, think again. It's not happening a lot, but it's happening. Distributing either the controllers, either by having multiple names, multiple IRC servers, basically multiple, multiple botnets within botnets. Um, using something else besides DNS. Um, this is, if I, was a, if I was a miscreant, and I'm not saying that I'm not, or I'm not saying that I am, but if you, if you were a miscreant and you want, if you're realizing that your names are being shut down, there's a, a number of ways that you can get around using DNS. You, certainly you can go query different DNS servers that people aren't watching. But it would be really easy just to set up a vanity web page somewhere with a list of IP addresses on it. And even if you're monitoring flows, you have really no way of telling which page they're getting at okay, and the IP addresses that they're pulling down from that page unless you're actually doing packet capture. And how many of you are doing packet capture and keeping that packet capture data for a long time? I suspect almost nobody. So it's really easy to harden some of this stuff. Okay? And that last one does happen, too. Okay? That's, again, why I don't uh, recommend people go out and try to mitigate this stuff by hand, because um, you may be sorry. Some of the people, now, the network operators can't do this by themselves. You know, we could possibly help with some of this, but there's, I think most people here would agree it's not our job to go fix all these bots. 
But if we can help, I would argue that we should do something. Okay? But there's other people who have a stake in this also. The AV vendors are the people who are pulling apart the malware. They find all the details about the botnet, the names, the channels, the next, all that sort of stuff. Often you can go out to a semantic site or, or any of the AV vendors, and you'll see that they've written up a full report on a particular um, piece of malware that contains an IRC bot. And they've listed not only the DNS name, but the channels and the NICs and everything else. And even after a couple of months, it's still active. So they find all this information, and they, what do they do with it? They just post it to a web page, and they kind of move on. I don't necessarily blame them. They've probably got lots of this stuff to look at and lots of better things to do than go close this stuff. But it might be nice for them to maybe at least have a central reporting uh, facility for some of these names or addresses that are being used. So it'd be closed down a lot faster. One of the things that I would like is an, kind of an end organization is if anyone who's running a DNS service allows people to point names at various IP addresses, I'd kind of like to know when you're pointing names at my IP addresses. Because generally, we don't allow that. So if that's happening, I'd kind of like to know about it. And if, if it's something that's happening, I go take a look at it and see if it's being used for inappropriate purposes. Now, the big ISPs probably don't need the service. It wouldn't be um, something that they could manage. But there's certainly a lot of vendor organizations where a lot of this stuff ends up. I'd like to know about it. Um, IRC operators have a uh, tough time because they usually volunteer and don't have a lot of spare time to do these um, sorts of things. But the more they can pass information on to us, certainly we can help them out. And of course, you know, the reason being all three of these people are being attacked by hosts on our network. So they have a stake in us. And finally, to wrap up the last couple of slides, here's some uh, information that I found useful. And the last slide, I don't know that it's online yet. I don't know if Barry Green is here. Um, but he told me he was going to put this on the uh, Cisco's FTP site. Um, so if it's, not that, if it's not there yet, it'll be there uh, pretty soon. And uh, there's a few things that you can go find. Everyone knows about a lot of this stuff. Um, but if, if you know what to search for, you can actually find your own botnets just by some simple web searches. And I'll kind of leave it at that, and you can go find your own when you've got free time. I hope I've left at least a couple of minutes for questions, but more importantly, answers. This is inappropriately set for Nordic people, so I find it useful. Um, how long do you expect to keep logs? I mean, you were, you were talking about doing tracing and logging and keeping that kind of stuff, and increasingly I'm getting pushback from legal and administrative people that keeping logs is a bad thing. So what, what is, how, help me reconcile this. Um, well, I, I can tell you as much disk space as you have, if you can use it, that's nice, because with something like DNS query logs, it's going to take a lot of space. You're probably not going to be able to keep that much anyways. Got about a half a terabyte of spool. Okay. Well, that, that's still probably not going to be that, mu that many logs, really, for, uh, for some organizations. Um, I, I can tell you what I do. Um, I don't tend to keep it more than one to three months. So after that point, it's really stale, and you can't really do much with at least DNS query logs after that point. Um, and I'm like you, I don't want to keep it very long either, or I'm like the lawyers. Um, I don't want to be in a situation where I have to have it. Um, I don't want it to be subpoenaed, actually. Yeah. So you, if it's a week or two old, it's probably not going to be that much use anyways. Particularly with botnets, the names tend, change, tend to change pretty often. So uh, what may be pointing to one host one day will be pointing to two or three different hosts the next day. OK. And you have intimated or suggested a couple of other ways of actually identifying bot activity other than yet another abuse of the DNS. Do you know anybody that's actually working on that? Uh, which example are you referring to? The, like the packet capture? Packet capture is a, a big hammer. Uh, anyway, maybe I should take this up in the security buff thing this evening. So let me do that. Yeah, there's lots of details I, I had to leave out. And some details I, I wanted to leave out because I didn't want certain people searching for certain strings and finding my name attached to it. I know you had something to say. <laughs> Hi, Nanog. Hi, Nanog. That's more like it. <laughs> and I am too. So I'm Rob Thomas with Team Cymru. 
And I'd like to thank John for putting together an excellent presentation. But I wanted to highlight a couple things. Thank you, John. So when people talk about bots, there tends to be a lot of focus on Microsoft. And that's certainly true, but you need to understand why. Because it's a target of opportunity. The miscreants are actually OS agnostic. They don't care. So how many of you have Juniper routers? You've got bots. It turns out Juniper routers are awesome little platforms for compiling FreeBSD bots, Kai-10, Knight, and running them. And lately, the miscreants have been scanning for TCP-22, easily guessed logins and passwords, and they put their bot on there. What they can't believe is they finally got a bot that has an OC-192. They don't have to lie anymore. They're increasingly moving to Unix-based bots because, remember, John said something early, but it was really the crux of this, is that it's all about profit. That's how these people are making a living. So they go to Unix-based bots. Why? Shock, amazement, Windows crashes. They can't keep their Windows bots up any longer than your users can keep their machines up. The record right now in the underground is 14 different active bots on a single Windows machine. That's pretty cool. Even the miscreants couldn't believe that thing booted. <laughs> the bots themselves are used by people who are not technical. By and large, the, those running botnets and using them for spam and DDoS extortion things, they're not technical people. For this reason, for example, a bot binary compiled by this gentleman for me, because I'm not a techie, will cost me $450 to $500 US. That's what I will pay him to type dot slash configure. You didn't know how much you were worth, did you? See, so you have to understand the motivation here is money. There's something you need to know about every single bot. So you may be thinking bots, DDoS, scan, and exploit. Nah, I don't have time for that. Every single bot has keystroke logging capability, and it actively hunts for financial data on the machines it infects. That means it's pulling people's bank accounts, their PayPal accounts, their Western Union accounts, and then they clean them out. Many of the botnets we see built today are simply built to be sold to those who will clean out those bank accounts. Or worse, we use those bank accounts to move money through. Are you familiar with the term, the underground term, cashier? Okay. What is a cashier? Here's how mad leet their skills are. A cashier is somebody who lives in the United States generally, has a US-based phone number, and makes calls all day long cleaning out bank accounts. They will get 50% of the proceeds for doing this for somebody who has bots that have these bank accounts. So when you think about bots and when you think about the threat and the nature of the threat, the thing you need to keep in mind is it's about the Benjamins. It's not about DDoS. It's not about who's cool. It's a business. And it's a very successful business. That's it. <laughs>